it's time. Young people are stepping up for climate ambition. Climate ambition is very simple. It is recognizing that there's more hard work that needs to be put into this space. We are the generation that is driving ambition. We are the change makers. And we are unstoppable. Climate ambition means to me higher NDC of different countries. Securing a future that is livable for my generation and the generations to follow. Climate ambition to me means the collective will. Speaking my truth to power. Being active in my country's agencies. And achieving biodiversity conservation. Climate ambition to me is seeing developed countries step up. Including more youth and having them drive the climate change agenda. What are we waiting for? We are the generation that drives ambition. We're youth for climate. We are driving climate ambition. Hello, everyone. Hey, thank you, everyone, for joining us. It's so great to have you, but we want to see your faces. So anyone who has not already turned, off, uh, turned on their video, please do so you can join the video wall and we'll be able to see you. And while you do that, it seems like a great time for us to introduce ourselves. Hi, everyone. My name is Ahmed Badr, uh, one of your co-moderators. I'm a poet and social entrepreneur, and as the founder of Narratio.org, I work to empower the world's displaced young people through storytelling and creativity. Uh, it's been so fun uh, looking at the poll results. Uh, it seems like most of you are uh, on the couch, but 2% are in the shower, apparently, which is really interesting. <laughs> well, you do have those like speakers you can put in the shower and just Right, right. Technology nowadays. Um, anyway, hi everyone. I'm Selena Abraha, your other co-moderator. I am a lover of people and land, and I work with the Global Landscapes Forum to bridge local ideas and action to global agendas. Ultimately, we want to build an inclusive movement on um, sustainable landscapes. And I may not be joining from the kitchen. It seems like 16% are, but I've always got um, my chocolate and my snacks nearby, which is super important to sustain yourselves. Absolutely. So today's session is really going to set the stage for where we are in terms of youth climate action and where we want and need to go over the next year and beyond. So we will be your hosts for the whole series. So please make sure to follow hashtag Youth for Climate Live to get the latest news on upcoming episodes. Um, and just a little housekeeping, this whole session is actually being translated into Italian. So if you want to switch to Italian, just change the language below. There's one option English and the other option, trust me, is Italian. So this is the first in a series of interactive virtual events hosted by the Italian Ministry for the Environment, Land and Sea in collaboration with the World Bank Group's Connect for Climate and the Office of the UN Secretary General's Envoy on Youth. As part of the initiatives organized in the run-up to the 2021 pre-COP26 in Milan, Italy, as well as COP26. Selena, you've been in the climate world for a number of years now. Uh, can you tell us a bit more about what COP and pre-COP means for anyone in our audience who, like me, is a bit newer to the space? Yeah, it's a really great question. We throw these like terms around, but basically a COP is short for Conference of the Parties. So that's the global climate su summit that happens every year, and it's always preceded by a pre-COP. So that's where negotiators come together and hash out the key issues that they're going to be discussing. So the pre-COP is happening next year and is being hosted by Italy. Um, so this seems like a great time to hand it over to the Italian Minister of Environment, Land and Sea, Minister Costa, who's going to tell us a bit more about how Italy is enhancing the role of young people within pre-COP 26. Oggi diamo il via ad un progetto ambizioso finalizzato a conoscere volti, storie e opinioni dei giovani impegnati nella lotta al cambiamento climatico. Sin dallo Youth Climate Summit di settembre, voluto dal segretario generale delle Nazioni Unite Gutierrez e realizzato anche con il concreto supporto italiano, l'Italia si è impegnata attivamente per valorizzare il protagonismo dei giovani. In questa scia, quali partner del Regno Unito nella presidenza della COP26, organizzeremo un evento interamente dedicato ai giovani, lo Youth for Climate, che riunirà a Milano centinaia di ragazze e ragazzi, ne ospiteremo due da ogni paese con parità di genere, per condividere conoscenze, elaborare idee e presentare proposte sul cambiamento climatico, 
direttamente ai decisori politici e ai negoziatori della Precop. Un'occasione per contribuire a cambiare il presente di tutti noi e a disegnare un futuro che appartiene soprattutto alle giovani generazioni. Gli eventi di COP26 slitteranno all'autunno 2021 a causa del Covid-19. Per sfruttare al meglio il tempo di qui ad allora e allargare partecipazione e dibattito in modo inclusivo, con l'inviata dei giovani del segretario generale Jayatma e gli amici del Connect for Climate, abbiamo immaginato la serie di eventi virtuali mensili che inauguriamo oggi, in cui voi giovani sarete i protagonisti, collegandovi da tutto il mondo attraverso i social più comuni. A cosa puntiamo? A sollecitare idee, raccogliere proposte, immaginare iniziative, costruire ponti tra giovani e istituzioni e processi internazionali. Tutti elementi che daranno forma al Youth for Climate e alla dichiarazione dei giovani per la terra che vi verrà adottata. Vi invito quindi a partecipare, sfruttando questa piattaforma che mettiamo a disposizione. Abbiamo bisogno della vostra dirompente energia e della vostra naturale spinta all'innovazione per iniettare ambizione nell'azione climatica globale. Together is possible. Go. And this is why the Youth for Climate Life series is so, so, so exciting. With COP and pre-COP being postponed until 2021 due to the COVID-19 crisis, Now is the time for young people to share ideas and proposals so that we can build bridges with international institutions and processes, just as the minister said. And it's so important to keep the momentum going as much as possible as we approach both COP and pre-COP. Absolutely. And I think it's, it's, it's tough because even though so many aspects of our lives have been postponed due to the crisis, um, we're also being called to keep the momentum going and, and to think differently and to take advantage of this pause to reimagine what normal could look like. And in the next coming months, we'll have the chance through this series to discuss how to build back better and how we can build back more sustainably. And not only is this event launching the upcoming Youth for Climate Life series, it's also marking the end of the Kickstarting the Sustainable Recovery series, which was organized by the World Bank Climate Change Group in partnership with Innovate for Climate. And you can actually catch up on the great content they've been sharing this month by following the hashtag Sustainable Recovery. And this is a theme that also emerges in our next video message from the Executive Secretary of UN Climate Change, Patricia Espinoza. Ladies and gentlemen, We are living through exceptional times. The COVID pandemic has caused suffering around the world and we are seeing human and economic losses unimaginable just a few months ago. But despite the hardships, these days are not without hope because this crisis has also shown to us that societies can, when necessary, pull together to address a global challenge with bold responses. And not only that, COVID-19 has shown which solutions work when humanity is faced with a global crisis. We could see firsthand the value of multilateralism, of accurate science and of early and ambitious action. I say, let's consider these lessons for humanity's biggest challenge in the long term, climate change. This is where you come in, because in recent years, who has been on the street calling for ambitious climate action, demanding that we listen to the best available science, urging countries to work together? It was you, young people. Today, when the pandemic has put us at a crossroad between reviving the old economy or shaping a new, cleaner model, your voice is needed more than ever before. We at UN Climate Change will continue our work at full speed and insist that 2020 remains the year of climate ambition. The June Momentum was a first step in that direction, but we need your support to make it happen. Together, We can use this historic moment to create a new normal, a healthier and more sustainable future for everyone. Thank you. As Patricia Espinosa said, it's so important that 2020 remains a year of climate ambition and that youth remain at the forefront. So 2020 also marks the fifth year of the Paris Agreement 
And this is the year that countries were meant to submit their enhanced national climate plans, NDCs, as part of the COP process, almost like a Paris 2.0. But before we move on to our next video message, I'm really curious to hear from everyone who's joining today. We want to know how many of you have attended a COP before. So we are launching a poll now. And take a moment to let us know, have you been to a COP? In the meantime, uh, it's a great time for me to ask our co-host, Ahmed, have you been to a COP before? I haven't. I've always been really curious about you know, the process and the actual experience of attending one. How many have you been to at this point? Um, it's crazy to think about, but I've actually been to five. Um, my first one was in Paris in 2015, which was historic. And so after that, I just couldn't pull myself away from the process. And I remember actually being in COP in Paris. It was the first global climate event I had attended. I was a second year college student. So I was a bit lost with what was happening. Um, but I remember talking to the Minister of Environment of Australia, who I just like happened to stumble into. And he was so passionate and committed. He basically started this conversation with me saying that his generation was gonna work really hard to put an international agreement in place. It was the first week of COP. They didn't know if they were gonna do it, but he was confident that they would. So he basically told me, he's like, if we get this done, and I think we will, it's up to your generation. We're handing this over to you and you've gotta make sure that this actually gets implemented. Um, and it was such a humbling moment, but one that made me realize I was joining a fight much bigger than one person or one generation. And here we are, five years later, with the UK hosting COP26 and partnership with Italy. And who better to honestly tell us about the priorities of this next COP than the president designate of COP26, Alok Sharma. I'd like to start by thanking the Italian Ministry for the Environment, Land and Sea, and all the partners who've organized this event. Today, the effects of climate change are all around us. Cyclones becoming stronger, wildfires destroying precious forests, floods submerging homes and devastating communities. We all know we have to act. And ahead of next year's COP26 climate summit, we will work with Italy, the UN, and our global partners to raise ambition, helping the world unite behind a fairer, greener, and more resilient recovery. We want all countries to commit to further cuts in carbon emissions by 2030, with all nations committing to reach net zero emissions as soon as possible. We've defined five key areas where, by working with our global partners, we can make progress faster. These are clean energy, clean transport, nature-based solutions, adaptation resilience, and finance. And whilst the UK and Italy will co-host the summit, success will belong to all parts of society. Around half the world's population is under the age of 30. Young people like you are driving climate action. In the lead up to COP26, you will have a crucial role to play. Next year will be the first time a youth event has been part of the pre-COP session. This will be a crucial platform for your voices to shape the debate. And through events like today's, I want to engage with as many young people as possible between now and the summit. Whether we live in the south or the north, the east or the west, we all share one life-giving but fragile planet. Together, we can preserve it for future generations. Thank you. It's so great to see the support coming from the highest levels of leadership at the COP and the recognition that youth will shape the climate debate next year. We've come so far in youth engagement and participation in climate issues over the past five years. And honestly, this is a testament to the power of youth activism and the global community that we've built. Um, and speaking of the community, we have all of you here today and I would love to take a look at the poll results and see how many have been to the COP before. It looks like 23% have said yes, they have and 77% have not been to a COP before, which is yeah, that's absolutely incredible. great. It, yeah, it, it's you know, this amazing uh, kind of opportunity for folks that have never heard, uh, been part of the process before to hear from folks that have been part of the process, right? So uh, it's a mix from folks that have been there uh, and then folks that have never been there. So I'm really excited to, to really kind of continue and, and see how this goes. 
Yeah, I think it's great because you've got you've got Ahmed and I who are pretty much a good example of um, all of you out there. And we're all, um, even if you have been to a COP before, there's always something new and there's always more to learn. And I think what's beautiful about this series is that we're going through so many different topics together over the next year. So we have an opportunity to learn together and grow together. Um, and by the end of it, really fully understand how we as young people can take action and propose solutions to climate action. Um, but this is a really good time, speaking of learning from each other, to introduce our three speakers for today's session who are all incredible young women. Yeah, absolutely. So we are going to be joined shortly by three amazing, amazing uh, young people. Um, hello, everyone. Again, it, it's uh, amazing to have three folks just join us today and to be able to hear their perspectives. Uh, first, we have Marie-Claire Graff, who's the focal point for Youngo and the co-founder of Sustainability Week International. We also have Elizabeth Watuti, who's an environmentalist and climate activist. And we also have Selena Neyruk Lamb, who's an amazing, amazing climate warrior from the Marshall Islands. Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for being with us today. Uh, it's so great to have all three of you um, because you offer such different perspectives. And so Marie Claire comes from Young Go, and for those of you who don't know, and she'll talk more about it, this is the official way for young people to engage in the COP process um, and really understand how you can um, kind of get more involved, propose solutions, policy recommendations in so many different topics, whether that's finance or restoration. She is your go-to when it comes to getting involved. Um, and then we've got Elizabeth, who's calling in from Kenya. She's the founder of the Green Generation Initiative, which nurtures young people to love nature and to become environmentally conscious at a young age. Um, and you, Elizabeth, are incredible, planted over 30,000 tree seedlings already and are a recipient of the prestigious Wangari Matai Award. So we're so happy to have you with us today. And then lastly, uh, Selena, we have the same name, uh, is joining us. Uh, she's a 22 years old climate warrior um, you describe yourself as a small island girl with big dreams, and we're so excited to hear the big dreams that you have and what you want to share with us today. So thank you to all three of you for joining. Absolutely. So my first question is to Marie Claire. You know, we've been talking about uh, COPS so far, you know, a subject that I know you're very familiar with. Uh, and, you know, 77% of folks in our audience at the moment uh, have never been to a COP before. So can you tell us a bit about how uh, youth have been engaging with the COP process? Absolutely. So young people have been engaging for a very, very long time uh, already at this international space. But also what is very important to mention that young people not only have been engaging at the international space, but also already before. So um, setting the agenda, um, being engaged with the delegation. But when the COP is uh, happening, uh, young people since actually 10 years now have this space, which is called Youngo, a combination of youth NGO. And this is the official space where young people engage. So it's about getting to know each other, planning um, different actions, that planning policies together, interventions, we, as an official constituency, have also the right, for example, to speak at the opening, at the closing, but also intervene at different expert meetings, uh, get in contact with, uh, with, with delegations and um, yeah, with, with the official negotiations. So young people very often um, want to have a better and a more ambitious outcome because we see where we are heading to. The science is very clear and um, yeah, we see also what is happening on the ground. Um, it can be droughts, it can be um, floodings, and so on. So young people are really on the forefront of, of the impact of, of climate change. So it's also very natural that the young people are, um, are very ambitious and driving the agenda. Um, but also very unfortunate, um, only governments are able to take decisions. So young people um, very often are invited to observe the process, but are not able to really take the decisions at the end. Um, and this is like where we as young people and then there is also, as last year, I was appointed by the president of Switzerland to be serving in the official um, delegation of Switzerland. And there are also some, yeah, unfortunately, few um, young people who are a part of the official delegations and also have the mandate to negotiate. And this is really something I am personally very keen on supporting young people, but also supporting governments and delegations to be more open and um, trust young people, because we have been seeing that young people can bring something to the table. We have been seeing that young, uh, young people are a very good asset having them in the um, in the official delegation and they are able to negotiate. So it needs um, 
when we talk about this intergenerational dialogue, a step from both sides, from young people, but also from the government, uh, to be able to take young people into the delegation. But nevertheless, it's very important to also have this so-called observer, observers having young go and having all these spaces um, at the COP, but also observers, as uh, Patricia Espinosa was saying, at the moment with the whole NDC process, it's absolutely crucial that also we as young people are engaged on the national level and engaging throughout the year, because ultimately, I mean, for people who have been at COP, it's, it's crazy, it's overwhelming, it can be frustrating. For the ones who haven't been there, it's it's absolutely um, an overwhelming situation. So many things are going on. So we cannot just go to COP and then expect that everything is happening according to what we want, but actually it needs a lot of preparation, meetings, and um, yeah, trying to get engaged with the delegations all of it before. Youngo is also providing the Conference of Youth, a three days conference happening prior to the COP, a place where young people can meet, engage, get together, and already prepare for the upcoming COP. So we provide uh, spaces for young people that we afterwards have meaningful engagement and can take the most out of this too crazy and tense week. Nevertheless, what I would love to see more is having more young people um, in the delegation and having them also really taking decision when um, yeah, when the decisions are taken, really have the young people on the on the table taking them. Yeah, that's such a great point. This is something that, you know, even though I've been to five cops, it's never as part of a country delegation. And so I started to have that conversation with my government of Eritrea uh, last year to talk about how can I be more supportive to this, you know? This is something we need to do as a, as a whole community and not just have such strong separations between government and everything. Um, so, yeah, we had an interesting comment from someone in the audience, Umang, who said, this COP will be the most important meeting since we're facing a pandemic. The decisions will be modernized and highly impactful. And I have to agree with you, this is one of the most crucial COPs. Also, the clock is ticking when it comes to the climate crisis and the actions that we need to take. Um, and when we talk about taking action, um, there's so many different ways that we can tackle the climate crisis. So this is a great opportunity to talk to Elizabeth because this year is not crucial not only for climate, but for nature. So why do you think it's important to also focus on nature's role in solving the climate crisis and how young people are really taking the lead in this space? Thank you, Salina, for that great question. Uh, it is important to first note that nature has become one of the most forgotten solutions to climate change today. And just to take everyone ba uh, back home to the challenges that we are facing today, uh, we need to note that over 1 million species risk extinction right now. And also the wild oceans, rivers, and lakes are almost becoming a soup of poison flowing with plastic waste. We've also uh, been losing acres of forest lands to deforestation and degradation. And of course, these are challenges that tell us very clearly that the human race is not in one uh, accord with nature. We are definitely just trying to have this war against nature. And we are forgetting that nature does play a critical role when it comes to climate change adaptation and mitigation. And that is why it is key for us to put in place nature-based solutions as climate action solutions as well. We need to give nature a chance. And I'll take you back to what we had previously during the World Environment Day, and we were saying that it's time for nature. It's time to tell the world why it's time for nature, because we need nature for survival and we need nature for our well-being. And so right now, I believe that we need to focus on biodiversity in our ecosystems, and we need to focus on how we protect, restore, preserve, and also sustainably manage them as a climate action solution. So we've seen uh, a lot of investments being pulled out of fossil fuels, but we also want to see the same energy when it comes to the investments that are fueling deforestation and the investments that are fueling degradation. So we cannot just focus on one aspect when it comes to addressing the climate crisis. We need to focus on all the solutions right now because we are at war with nature. And unless we stop being at war with nature, we definitely not have halfway solved most of the challenges that we are facing today. So, of course, young people have been involved so much when it comes to nature. Personally, I'm someone who has been connected to nature, I mean, all my life since childhood. And I always love to say that nature, we should be seeing nature as a part of us and not apart from us. Sure, sure, sure. Because when we are connected to nature, then definitely we will love nature and we'll be able to protect nature. So through the initiative that Salina just mentioned, we've been just trying to train the young children on how they can be able to get connected to nature because there's that, there's that big disconnect that is causing a lot of challenges right now today. And so one of the solutions that we realize, and it's not the only nature-based solution, we have so many 
nature-based solutions, and one of them was tree growing. Uh, because we've been talking about planting trees all over the world, but the question I always ask people is, how many of these trees get to grow up to maturity? So we have to make sure that we're inculcating a tree growing culture and growing trees for impact. And of course, nature-based solutions are beyond planting trees. We have so many other solutions such as sustainable agriculture and also forest restoration, because even if we plant trees and we haven't stopped deforestation, then we will not be making any huge difference. So I believe that right now, and also with young people just raising their voices and saying no to deforestation, raising their voices and saying that, yes, it's time for nature. These are some of the solutions that uh, the young people have been taking. And uh, on top of that also, uh, right now I'm heading some campaigns and also a consortium on green spaces under the Wangari Mavai Foundation. And we're also trying to say that we need green spaces in our cities. These are some of the solutions that we need to be focusing on when, when it comes to nature-based solutions. And of course, we cannot ignore nature because in nature, we will find our solutions. Thank you. Wow. Yeah, thank you so Covered much. I think it's so, so, so important to highlight nature as a collaborator, right? As, as uh, kind of an entity that we need to, to work with and not be in battle against. Right. And so thank you so much for highlighting that urgency and, and for sharing your personal experience. I think, you know, uh, Selena mentioned earlier the 30,000 trees that you planted. And I, again, the need for nature based solutions are so necessary so we can see that those 30,000 reach their fullest, fullest uh, potential. So thank you so much. I, I want to talk to Selena about um, this kind of the issue of vulnerable communities. You know, you're coming to us from the Marshall Islands where many communities are under threat from climate change. Uh, I'm curious, what kind of work have young people been doing to support vulnerable communities? Yale, thank you, Ahmed and Selena, for, um, for the wonderful introduction and for helping leading the conversation. So for those who don't know, because I always have to do this, um, Marshall Islands is located halfway between Hawaii and Australia. And we are, as Ahmed said, one of the most vulnerable countries to climate change. So growing up, um, my similar, I would like to say, my, my story, I would like to say it's not, it's not unique. It's very common among people who come from vulnerable communities. Unfortunately, it is the case that most of the time the situation that we are facing in our stories are often skimped over. Um, but I would like to bring that into this conversation that growing up in the Marshall Islands, you are very much experiencing climate change firsthand. And this is something that has been happening for years. And seeing it every year, it's not something that makes your heart happy. And every year having to face this, you know, I grew up very, feeling very angry and anxious and just very scared about where my home will be at the state it will be in the future and how I will communicate that to the global community and that all of us needs to work together. And so in 2015, that was really the changing time for me, like the tides really changed the flows and everything in that I um, went to my first environmental laureate event and I was invited to give a speech about the effects of climate change in the Marshall Islands. And again, like I said before, I came in very angry and really feeling like there was really nowhere to go to and that no, nothing was going to be nothing was going to be done but then seeing the reaction from the people in the audience was very validating and it was really that changing moment that I was like wow people actually care and because in the Marshall Islands I was only given one side of the story and then I came to this climate con to this environmental laureate event, and I saw a different story, and it ignited the fire in me again to share. And a lot of people came forward, and they were like, "You have a, you have power in your storytelling, and that will help change the conversation." And storytelling is very much ingrained in our culture, in our traditions, and 
it is really what people from the martial arts have been using as a, as a means of dealing with the trauma of climate change happening right in their backyard because it's a very scary thing to to witness every year and almost every day and in hand in hand with the our government the Marshallese government and, and along with a number of NGOs from the Marshall Islands who very much believe wholeheartedly in youth leadership and the inclusion of our voice the youth's voice in these global spaces that in, in communicating in the Marshall Islands as well, RMI and Marshall Islands has really mobilized our youths domestically and internationally to speak on the effects because we see that the way we communicate is really powerful and it reaches to people in ways that they never really had been able to. And a lot of that is really through the use of art, uh, poetry, uh, using using singing and arts and anything that they can, uh, they are able to share the experience that we Marshallese are facing. So, the ch but the challenge that we often face is because we are from coming from the Marshall Islands and from, you know, vulnerable communities, uh, our goals can be considered extreme to the majority and 1.5 to many developing and developed countries is stretching it a bit too far but that is our lifeline and it's, sometimes it's hard but we always have to remind ourselves to be firm in that number and in that lifeline because it really is the chance that we have yeah it's, I, i'm so glad that you joined us today because it's so important to hear your voice and your perspective um, and I just want you to know that we you know, hear you and that everyone here, the hundreds that are watching, we're in this together. It's the fight that we have to do for each other. Um, and it's something that I think storytelling, what you mentioned is so important. So thank you so much for sharing your stories with us. Um, thank you to Elizabeth and Marie Claire for sharing how we can, um, we need to get in touch with our countries and our governments. We need to uh, look at nature as a solution and stop being at war with it. And we we have to really keep in mind the vulnerable communities that are at the center of this and the people that we want to protect our family um, across the world. So I want to take a chance now to turn to the audience. You have a chance to tell us where do you want the conversation to go? So we're about to launch another poll where you can share your perspectives and tell us what we should talk about next. So this is a sneak peek at some of the topics of upcoming sessions. Uh, and we'd really like you to pick one for us to delve a bit deeper into with our wonderful, wonderful speakers. Uh, and so the question is from the selection of thematic areas uh, that we'll be focusing on in the coming months, you'll see we'll be very busy in the coming months uh, and into next year. Uh, what topic would you like the speakers to discuss now? Uh, so first we have driving sustainable recovery, driving climate ambition, driving empowerment, protecting the most vulnerable, driving innovation and entrepreneurship, driving adaptation and resilience, and lastly, driving local action. Uh, and so lots to pick from. Let us know what you'd like us to focus on. Selena, which one uh, do you prefer? Which one are you most excited about? Uh, I'm hoping that people pick the sustainable recovery. Um, because I studied economics and environmental science, and I've always been waiting for the moment to merge the two and for that to come into the center of the debate. So I'm excited about how we could talk about what a new model could look like. What about you? I think protecting vulnerable communities um, is one that's really close to home. You know, I work with displaced communities uh, and storytelling and, and and try to kind of empower those communities by sharing their own stories and helping them share their own stories on their own terms. And so uh, I think making sure that in this conversation, as we talk about climate action, that uh, vulnerable communities are allowed to, again, share their perspective and um, you know, are allowed to be amplified you know, because you know, climate change is urgent for all of us, but it's especially urgent uh, for these vulnerable communities. And so uh, I think that's something that we really need to, to emphasize and something that really is uh, important for us to highlight, you know, as uh, Selena mentioned earlier. Um, I agree. It's I agree. so, so, so important. Yeah. So let's see what the audience has picked. Oh. <laughs> You know, there's a role for talking about how we can um, really 
improve the lives of those most vulnerable through a sustainable recovery. So I feel like we can find a middle ground here. Um, so we've got the sustainable recovery. And while we start discussing this with our amazing panel, uh, let us know to the audience if you have any questions for any of our speakers. Just do that by typing them into the chat. We'll reserve time at the end for one or two of your questions um, towards the end of the section. So we're going to head back to our lovely speakers. Yeah, so uh, for a question to Elizabeth, um, you know, sustain, uh, driving sustainable recovery uh, is our topic. I'm curious, from your perspective, how are young people uh, driving action towards sustainable recovery? Oh, you seem to be muted, I think. Okay, sorry. Uh, thank you so much for that question. And I'm really excited that the audience picked on sustainable recovery. I was um, also for it. And uh, young people, of course, have been tapping into their skills in so many ways to try and, sp and speak up for climate action and, of course, through sustainable recovery. And you'll agree with me that we are living in difficult times right now with the COVID-19. But this, again, has taught us that we need to definitely focus on how we are going to address climate action through uh, turning back to nature as well. And I think this all goes back down to nature-based solutions. And of course, young people have been working uh, on different solutions. And this goes back down to the grassroots levels. And these are the stories that you never get to hear about people that are driving action in their communities. And this goes back down mostly to the vulnerable uh, groups and communities. Um, you know that Africa, for example, uh, contributes less than 5% of the global greenhouse gas emissions. But then Africa is the most hit when it comes to the impacts of the climate crisis. And of course, our solutions right now lie in nature. Our solutions lie in how we are going to turn back to the environment, turn back to nature, and make sure that we are not at war with nature, but we are for nature. And of course, most of the solutions, like I mentioned before, they are uh, around biodiversity conservation and also sustainable, uh, that are focused on sustainable development. And I will just uh, mention uh, a few examples, for example, uh, like through my initiative, we've been working on how we can make sure that we are addressing food insecurity through uh, forest restoration. And by forest restoration, I mean that we've been focusing on how we can get the children in schools to grow fruits or, or rather to grow trees that are going to give them a nutritious source of food for them. And these are fruit trees that they get to grow and nurture and adopt each in their school compound. And apart from that, the young people have also been driving action through awareness and education because people need to be informed. People need to know about the crisis that we are in right now. And they also need to be informed that they can be part of the solution. So we need to also empower them to know how they can be part of the solution. And so education and awareness has been one of the ways in which young people has been uh, focusing on making sure that we are informing the people. Because uh, probably when we get to the Conference of Paris, we don't get to see these people that are working on the grassroots levels. We don't get to hear their stories. We talk about their challenges, but we don't get to give them the platform to share what it is that they're going through and how we can be able to address these challenges. And so just by raising their voices, uh, this is one of the most powerful ways in which the young people are speaking up because the challenges that we are facing today and every decision that is going to be made today is only going to affect the most, uh, is only going to affect the young people on the larger perspective. And so we have to give them a space on the table and make sure that we are also giving nature a voice because if we don't give nature a voice and a chance, then we will not be, uh, we will not have solved our challenges right now. So I believe that uh, by just using their skills and also their stories and inspiring people and just taking what it is that they are doing right now to also inspire other people to take action is a powerful tool that the young people of the world right now that are focusing on. And so I believe that we need to definitely invest in nature's ability to address climate change right now, because without nature, definitely uh, it's going to be challenging for us to address most of the challenges. And I always see nature as one of the greatest tools when it comes to climate change adaptation and mitigation, because we need to survive and for us to survive we need to also make sure that nature is surviving and nature can be able to sustain the impact of the climate crisis so it is important for each and every person right now to also focus and dig deeper on the grassroots uh, solutions that are being done by people out there because young people are waking up and they're stepping up to the challenge and taking the lead when it comes to addressing the impacts of the climate crisis right now 
Thank you. I, I, Elizabeth, I always love to hear you speak because you speak on such incredible points that um, we often forget about. And it's so important, um, not only young people telling our stories, but to tell the, to bring in the voice of nature, to tell the stories of nature and, and um, the future that we want, right? Which is one in where we get to live in harmony and this opportunity for the recovery to do that. Um, also, you talking about local action, that these local stories that we don't hear about often enough. Um, and there's a comment from, uh, I think, Jibrilla on the importance of partnerships between civil society organizations who are doing that great work on the ground, led by young people and everyone working together. And so I think that's really important. Um, it's something we have to talk about more. Um, but Selena, I want to come to you now. I do have some good news looking at the percentages. 24% um, said sustainable recovery and 22% said empowerment and protecting the most vulnerable. So I think there's an opportunity to, to talk about both and to look at the intersection. <laughs> so what, what do you think is most important to talk about and how um, young people need to be more involved in, in this, this intersection? I think you're muted. <laughs> So personally, I would like to see more inclusivity within um, the youth community and in the fight that we are doing with climate change. And also for one to be aware of their privilege and use that to give space to those coming from vulnerable communities. And we've seen it happen so many times Again, when I mentioned earlier that our voices from communities that are most affected, they get skimped over because our priorities, our livelihood is just not as important as the rest. And I just would like to see that inclusive inclusion and the awareness of privilege of certain youths that come from certain countries and certain backgrounds and that there is that that is what they can do to help us in the long run to really drive home the message and the urgency and why we need to act right now. And I think that comes from those who are experiencing it firsthand, those who are working on the grassroots level and really are aware of what is happening. But at the same time, like youths are, as we've seen happening throughout like recent years, youths are very willing to talk and, and act 100%. And youths are aware, we are aware that, you know, business as usual or what we considered was normal was, was and is destructive. And that needs to change. And so... That is why youth in these spaces is so important because we bring in this perspective, this urgency as a collective whole body. Because even with the various goals that we each have per for ourselves or for our home or our country or our organization, whatever it is that we are representing, the big goal that we are all trying to align for is to save our planet to save our personal homes. And that is why youth in these spaces is so important. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. No, absolutely, and I think they're, it's so, so important to think about how we are in solidarity with one another. And when once we gather uh, you know, virtually or in person and, and discuss these issues, we have to be able to meet each other uh, where we're at and acknowledge the, our position into the, to this issue. We have to acknowledge our privileges. We have to acknowledge our own kind of uh, backgrounds or, and our own kind of entry point into this issue, right? And so uh, thank you so much for, for highlighting that. I think we need to be very, very self-aware as we engage in these discussions and as we kind of look forward to, to how we can work on things together and how we can collaborate. Um, and speaking of collaboration, Marie Claire, um, I'd love to hear your thoughts about how uh, governments uh, can support youth action uh, in this space. Uh, I know Jabrilla earlier uh, commented about the importance of partnerships between civil society uh, organizations led by young people um, and governments. And so would just love to hear your perspective in this regard. You're really at the forefront of this. Absolutely. I think it has a lot to do um, with, now I hear my echo. 
it doesn't have to do with the trust um, that we trust the government that they are taking us serious. In the past, unfortunately, a lot of young people have been tokenized. Um, and what we want is like a meaningful, positive, impactful engagement. So we want to be here and talk to you on the same A level, right? Of course, we don't have the as much experience, but we have uh, maybe a, a fresher and newer mind and we have a lot of good idea. Also, a lot of us have been updated by the latest uh, stage of the, of the science, right? Because we are maybe still in the education sector um, or we are the ones being on the ground and, and seeing how, how, how climate um, change has the effects on us. So involving young people has a multiple different um, good and, and, and really leverage reasons. And uh, there we have to, I believe, really create more trust um, because very often still uh, young people are seen, oh, they can strike on the streets, but they cannot meaningfully contribute to this very complex um, process. And also there, I, of course, we don't understand every technical negotiation, but honestly, to be very true, I have met a lot of people who have been in this space, negotiators for 10 years, and they also don't know. So being also very open and honest and just say, oh, I don't know, being more human beings at this conference and not pretend to be someone um, because we are there and being more open, open-minded, open with open heart approaching um, these negotiations, because I do believe um, if we would meet each other at these conferences as human beings, rather as negotiators, observers from this and this country, we would actually solve the, the climate crisis very easily. Um, but we somehow and sometimes build up um, some walls to protect ourselves. And I think this is one of the biggest challenges. So from the from governments and institutions, I really hope that we can establish this trust, having meaningful youth engagement, um, taking young people into the delegations, giving them a mandate to negotiate, um, also discussing what topic they are very passionate about, because this is where the young people have um, a lot of ideas and also understand technical negotiations. There are incredible people in Yango and in many other organizations who have the capacity to be able to negotiate, but also in the lead up to COP26, involving young people in the planning and the agenda setting. This is very crucial because at the end, you're going to discuss have been on the what is already done. There is, for example, the Friends of the COP, and there is unfortunately no young people. Um, despite there, uh, we have been talking that there are so many young people around the world who are um, aiming for high ambitions. So for me, it's I, I really wonder why young people are then again excluded, despite everyone is talking about there. It's now the now is the time to involve young people. Uh, so there is a lot of room. And then when we are at the COP, um, really having this. Um, yeah, being being more human um, and listening to the young people uh, from their from their own country, listening to young people, um, listening to stories from young people from from the vulnerable communities, li listening um, to each other, and for young people that we don't have to spend so much time on fighting to sit at the table, but rather can focus on our actual impact. Because if we always have to fight to actually be invited to a meeting, we spend so much time, we waste so much time, um, and cannot even get to the essence of it. So I would really wish that we take this 2020, this year now, which is kind of a gap in the international negotiations, um, but really take it as a leverage and um, that we enter SB and also COP um, with full potential and power of young people. I think it's what you're saying is so powerful and what I'm hearing from everyone is, is um, speaking to something that is true for us, which is we get to build the world that we want. Like we, um, not just the speakers, the moderator, but like everyone on the audience right now by choosing that, you know, we want to stop fighting and stop competing and genuinely collaborate by being aware of our privileges and deciding how we want to engage in relationship with each other. We get to build the community that is, you know, a safe space that is empowering for us and that really drives us forward. So I'm, I'm just grateful that you've all joined us today, um, that you and the audience are actively engaging and submitting your, your thoughts. Um, and yeah, I want to take a time now to kind of go to the audience questions. We have a few that have come through. Um, and Selena, I think this speaks perfectly to um, what you just touched on, which was how can we actively lift up the voice of young people from vulnerable communities as a young person of privilege? Thank you for the question. So one way you can really do that is what I've seen from people who have helped myself and uh, a lot of climate 
activists from the Marshall Island as well is whenever there's a conference that they are having and they they feel like it would be a, it would be a loss if voices from vulnerable communities are not included in it so they ask they ask the people who are organizing if they can be if they can invite another person into the conversation because that would make it more um more closer to the heart and to the to the heart of the issue, and so that is one way that you can definitely work to ensure that um, that people who are who don't always have access to these spaces are included as well. Thank you. I think that's a really good point. And um, also, one thing I just want to add: I learned this when I um, so I grew up in the U.S. and when I left and kind of engaged a lot more internationally is that we all have different ways of speaking and engaging and um, some are more assuming and like louder than others. Um, and I think being also just conscious and aware of your voice um, and how much you're using it is is really key, or at least it's something I've learned for myself. Um, there's another question that I think is really relevant to right now. And I think I wanna hand this to Marie Claire. Um, and it is, one, what are the best things we can do on a local level during lockdown to make a difference? Um, and then there's a simple one, which is how can young people get involved in Yungo? Yeah, for um, for being in Yangu, I can um, share off the results of my email, so you can just text me and I will add you to the mailing list and to all the communication channels. And um, for what you can do in lockdown, it's really hard to change a running system. And our system before the crisis has been running and young people haven't been heard, vulnerable communities, women of color, people of color and so on. Now Corona did a full stop. This gives us an incredible chance to use this full stop and reimagine and implement this vision and this this uh, program is we all have been um, somewhere in our mind right but we couldn't bring it into practice and having this this full stop and having now also a lot of recovery money and um, recovery um, uh, policies and emergency programs available really incorporate climate nature and people in the heart of all these recovery programs. And I think it's the role of young people to remind our governments, we are here, we are watching you, and we won't forgive if you, now you go back to the normal, the normal before, which was not sustainable, which was not climate friendly, and was not putting people on the heart of the decisions. And now we have this incredible opportunity. It was very sad that we needed Corona to actually have this opportunity, because I do believe that humanity would be clever enough and smart enough to make the right decisions, but now we have it. And um, yeah, we cannot go on the streets, but still we can use other forms, um, reminding our politicians, our parliamentarians, our delegations, and um, everyone that um, yeah, we as humans need to be part of this of this decision. And climate and sustainability needs to be recognized in in all recovery programs. Thank you for that, Marie Claire. Again, such a timely question. You know, for. Uh, a lot of us are in lockdown and we're trying to figure out what can we do to, to still work on these issues that are so important to us. Uh, we have a question for uh, Elizabeth um, from our audience. How can, how can we motivate the youth to take an initiative uh, or to take initiative in conserving biodiversity to mitigate the effects of climate change? Oh, I think you're, you're yeah, muted. <laughs> Sorry, thank you so much for that question. I think one of the ways when it comes to being motivated to uh, be part of biodiversity conservation, it goes back down to being passionate about it. And of course, having that love for biodiversity, that love for nature, because I always love to say that you protect what you love. So if you have that personal love that comes from deep within you to protect the biodiversity, then you will definitely step up and be part of the solution. And I think uh, when it comes to uh, activism, for example, we have two types of how we get involved. And one of the types is which I always encourage people is to have a natural uh, call to action that comes from deep within you. And the other one is where we probably, people do it because it's a duty imposed upon them. So for us to be able to motivate the young people and the children out there to be able to be part of biodiversity conservation, we have to 
inculcate that inner drive and passion and call uh, for them to take action when it comes to biodiversity conservation. And that, uh, to me, is definitely by bringing them closer to nature. I personally, uh, my love for nature is because I got closer to nature. I got connected most to the forest landscape having grown up in one of the most forested regions in Kenya. And that is what, uh, that's where my roots are in. That's why I am so passionate. That's why I love nature because I grew up seeing the value. I grew up knowing that I need nature for my own survival and I need nature for my own health and well-being. And so if we inculcate the same passion and the same uh, need and the same uh, appreciation for nature and also the green spaces upon uh, the people, then we are going to be giving them the natural call to action to be able to conserve the environment. And so there's so many ways in which the young people can be involved. And of course, one of the ways I always encourage people is to join the networks and the initiatives that are running when it comes to biodiversity conservation and get involved and be part of the solution. Because uh, we cannot wait for anyone to be the solution. We are the ones that are responsible. We are the ones that see the urgency. And so if we who see the urgency are not going to step up and be part of the solution, then nobody else will. And at the end of the day, we will just be uh, waiting for solutions and not doing anything. So I think the first thing is for us to just step up. And the fact that you want to be involved means that you have seen the urgency. And so it's just upon each and every one of us not to wait longer and just get involved and be part of every action that is being taken right now. Uh, because the networks are there, the solutions are there, and it's just up to us to step up and make sure that we are being part of the solution. And I always was uh, always encourage the fact that we cannot leave anyone behind because we think that they're too young. I mean, no one is too young to make a difference and no one is too young right now to be part of the process. Even a four-year-old needs to learn about nature. They need to learn about the value of a tree. They need to learn about the value of a flower, the value of a forest or any river or lake out there. So we need to teach them and make sure that this love is deep within them. And that's why, for example, as a personal initiative, I will not throw trash out of the car windows because I know that's wrong. I've grown up knowing that that's wrong because trash belongs where it belongs and not just on the highways. So I think this is something that we need to inculcate in people to have that personal responsibility that comes from deep within. And that, to me, those small acts, when they get multiplied by millions of people, are going to eventually make a huge difference in the world today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Elizabeth, Marie, Claire, Selena. This has been an incredible conversation. And I wish a thank you to the audience. There's so many other questions we wish we could get to. Um, but we are running out of time, just a few minutes left. Um, so I just want to say a big thank you. And to all of you in the audience, uh, we had a closing question around vision. So if you want to just share in the chat box a few words on what your vision for youth leadership um, is in driving climate action moving forward, we'd love to hear the words that you think are most important and the things that you've taken away from this session. Um, so yes, thank you so much to our speakers for joining us and helping us launch the first Youth for Climate live series. It's been wonderful to have you with us today. <laughs> Absolutely. And again, your work in leadership is so, so, so important. And we're really lucky to have you join us. And we're excited to, to take your lead. Uh, you know, it's so energizing to hear all of your amazing perspectives uh, and, and just these really, really important topics about just being so self-aware uh, about how we're entering these conversations and uh, really talking about where we're at and where we need to go and everything in between. So thank you so much for joining us. And this is just the beginning, right? So Selena, what do we have to look forward to? That is true. This is not the end at all. This is just the beginning of our community and our conversations. So I'm super excited to share that we have sessions lined up almost every month between now and March of next year. So this is our chance to commit to learning and growing together. Um, so make sure to follow hashtag Youth for Climate Live, as well as um, at Connect for Climate, UN Youth Envoy, and at Precop 26 ITA for updates. And so now that we've given you a sneak preview of some of the upcoming topics, uh, here to wrap things up is Jayathma Wukramanayaka, the UN Secretary General's Envoy on Youth, who has a very special announcement about how you can get involved. Hi everyone, my name is Jayathma Wukramanayaka and I am the United Nations Secretary General's Envoy on Youth. You might know that this year's climate negotiations were postponed due to the COVID-19 pandemic.
The climate crisis, however, remains an urgent challenge. For this reason, I am so excited to partner with the government of Italy and the World Bank Group's Connect for Climate program to bring to you the Youth for Climate live series. I hope you'll tune into this monthly series in the lead up to COP26 as we discuss important issues like recovering sustainably from the COVID-19 pandemic, applying nature-based solutions to climate change, and fostering youth innovation and entrepreneurship. Also, be sure to keep an eye out for the upcoming opportunities to make sure that your voices are heard as we move towards the 2021 pre-COP climate negotiations in Milan. We want to hear from you. Now, before I finish, I want to leave you with a question. If you were your country's Minister for the Environment or Climate, what steps would you take to address the climate crisis? Record your answers to this question and share your video message on social media and with us. We'll help bring it to those who should hear it. Don't forget to use the hashtag youth for climate live. I really look forward to hearing from all of you. Thank you. And what a great question. If you are your country's climate minister, what steps would you take to address the climate crisis? And we really do want to hear from you. So please make sure to record your video and share your answer on social media by tagging hashtag youth for climate. Yeah, I'm definitely gonna have to make my video, um, but we have time to do it. And our next session is actually gonna be on July 24th. And it is on the topic that you chose to, that you wanna learn more about, which is driving the sustainable recovery. So we are so happy and excited to see you all then. Thank you so much everyone for joining the launch. Bye everyone, thanks for joining Bye. us. Bye.